Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all doing? Doing pretty good? Good, good. That's nice. Enthusiasm. Thank you all for being here for What Matters to Me and Why, where we welcome my very special, uh, our very special guest and my good friend, Francille Wilson. I encourage all of you to grab some lunch if you haven't already done so. Um, and it's a great turnout today, so thank you again for being here. Before we begin, I just want to make a few quick announcements for upcoming events. On a Tuesday, um, February 12th, next Tuesday, to celebrate Valentine's Day, we're hosting an event called Love, Heartbreak, and Yoga. It's going to be uh, two yogis talking about their new books on love and yoga. One is about how to find true love and how yoga can help you do that. And the other is about when true love leaves you, how yoga can help you recover. So it's a full, you know, from cradle to grave kind of approach. So please join us. It's 7 p.m. Tuesday, uh, DML 240. It's a Spectrum event. You can RSVP online. It's free and open to the public. The Catholic Center is also hosting a weekend retreat, a spiritual retreat called The Wizard of Oz as a Spiritual Adventure. Um, that's going to be on uh, February 15th and 16th. And if you're interested, you can contact the Office of Religious Life or the Catholic Center. And the H Hindu students are hosting a regional conference for Hindu students on uh, February 16th right here at USC. And if you're interested, please contact the Office of Religious Life, and we'd love to see you there. You know, last month I was uh, traveling in South and East Africa, uh, and I spent some time with a good friend of mine, um, Sam Roberts, who's a professor at uh, Columbia University. And we were in Dar es Salaam, in Stonetown, uh, in Bagamoyo. And he asked me if I knew Francille. Uh, and I said, of course, I know and love Francille. And he said, well, you should know what a great mentor she's been for so many young scholars around the country, including scholars who aren't at USC, like myself. Um, and he went on singing her praises for the week that we spent together. And um, uh, I'm really grateful that we also have so many students here who have been nurtured and mentored by Francille. And so to introduce Francille today, we have one such student. She's a doctoral student in American Studies and Ethnicity. Please join me in welcoming May Al-Hassan. Thank you, Varun. I'm really excited to be introduced by Varun and then to introduce Professor Wilson. They're both mentors for me. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Doing well? Um, I want to start off by telling a little bit of a story. I told Professor Wilson that I was going to tell a story. She probably doesn't know where I'm going to go with this. But um, one of my first encounters with Professor Wilson outside of the classroom was at a screening for a film called Black Power Mixtape. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Anybody in the room? No? Yes? It's an excellent documentary, and it profiles black, uh, black power figures and important African Americans during the, the time period is 1965 to 1975. And throughout the film, it was interesting, because I was sitting with her, she would lean in and tell me, yeah, um, I know him back at um, University of, I don't know, Massachusetts, um, in her New England days. And uh, she would lean in and talk about experiences she had with some of the figures in the film, like Stokely Carmichael and others. And I just thought to myself, I mean, not only does Professor Wilson study intellectual history and African-American intellectual and labor history, but she lives it and she lived it. And to me that is one of the most important things about finding an academic mentor is not only their willingness and interest to mentor you, but the way that they're engaged with their topics and engaged with the material that they're studying. And to move on to the next part of um, why, why she holds a special place in my heart, um, it is because she cares. And I don't know if she's going to go into what matters to her, but I do definitely know that her students matter to her immensely. And um, I could just tell by the last couple of years working with her in class and just speaking maybe briefly about the topics that I was interested in, in studying, but more so what fascinated me was how much she cared for my well-being. And so it wasn't just the material for her, it was it was how the student was doing. And as I've gone through academia and been mentored by various figures, I found this to be a really important component about the, the academic relationship with a professor. And so I'm sure she's going to go into this, but I really appreciate the fact that she doesn't compartmentalize care. For her, 
it's a whole experience. It's one of the students' passion, interests, and their well-being. And with that, I want to bring up Professor Wilson. Before I say good afternoon, I do want to say because I am um, old school, or perhaps just old, uh, there I do, my students do call me Professor Wilson. And part of this is because I grew up under segregation and black women and men never, were always called by their first names. And so, and, and also I spent some time in, um, in French-speaking Africa and, you know, the French, when you get to be close, then you give permission to use another, you know, to use the tutoyer, to be familiar. And it's not that I don't want the students to eventually become familiar, but, and it's not so much about hierarchy, but to me, it's about being called out of my name. And so, um, I think it's, and also because of the way I was raised, I don't call my mother's friends by their first names. <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes if I really uh, feel like we're getting close, I might call them aunt, <laughs> you know, aunt so-and-so. But this is uh, part of the way I've been raised. And today, I really want to thank everybody for coming. Happy Black History Month, which uh, for those of you that have been complaining that Black History Month is the shortest month, um, you should know that now Black History Month officially starts on Martin Luther King's birthday. <laughs> so it's actually six weeks long. Um, and um, preparing for this talk turned out to be a lot harder and much more fruitful than I thought it would be. How do you know? just what matters to you. Is what matters to you a list of things you like or ideas you believe in? I'm going to suggest that asking me to think about what matters to me has shown me that what matters to me is a little bit different from my beliefs or my Facebook likes, <laughs> if I actually ever liked anyone on Facebook. Over the years, I've found that the things that really matter to me are often revealed in times of crisis or change. For example, when my father became very ill, I got a laser-like focus on what I valued and who valued me. When I moved to Los Angeles and USC from the Washington, D.C. suburbs almost six years ago, changing my job and my geography, I had to reevaluate many of the things that I thought mattered to me, such as the Atlantic Ocean, ACC basketball, the Acela train to New York, and those are just the A's. I could add spring and fall, Eastern Standard Time, a real ch Philly cheesesteak bought in Philly, a real crab cake, which can only be bought between Maine and uh, the Chesapeake Bay, and being able to drive to the ferry for Martha's Vineyard from my own house. I still miss those things, but they don't really matter. They aren't essential to who I am and what gets me up in the morning and keeps me going. So what does matter to me? In my professional and personal life, the past matters. In my personal life, family, friends, faith are my touchstones, the triad that allows me to teach, to serve, to seek. Integrity, fairness, and justice matter to me and have been modeled by my family, friends, and faith journey. So what matters to me is the past, my family, friends, and faith, a, and a personal belief system that stresses integrity, fairness, and justice. And yes, students matter because I want to be the mentor that I was lucky enough to have and also the mentor that I didn't have. 
Today, I'm going to talk mostly about how my birth family shaped my sense of obligation to the past. But the Wilson Gregory family that I married into some 40 years ago and my two sons do matter to me more than air. I've been on a remarkable journey as a Rusan Wilson. Together with, with both sides of my family, I have learned how, to, how we can take care of each other when sick and how we can bury our dead properly. Almost all gone too soon. And now I find myself among the elders standing in the gap, getting ever closer to the front of the line. My, both, both my families, Wilson and Rusan, cheer for me when I have, have even the smallest victory, from kindergarten graduation to graduate school, and pull me back on the path when I have faltered. And I've also been so blessed to have someone to love for a lifetime, my husband, Ernest Wilson, and to discuss every difficult decision that we have ever made as a parent, partner, or professors. My whole family matters. Friendship matters. Perhaps friends matter to me so much because I am an only child. So I found soul sisters and play brothers along the way. Leaving my sisters on the East Coast was a lot harder than I could have ever imagined. And I was not truly happy here till I found a sister of the heart in LA. Although I didn't mention this talk to my sisters back on the East Coast, when I was really starting to panic about what I might say, almost every one of my close friends called or emailed me, just quite out of the blue, to touch base reminded me of the sustaining power of friendship and vibrations, actually. Uh, I felt like they must have known, they really did feel that I was uh, getting a little worried about what I might do. These friends, sister friends matter to me because they keep me grounded and each has a special quality that reminds me how I might be a better person. Some are fellow sister scholars whose work inspires me, like my first real mentor, Nell Irvin Painter, and whose critiques of my work have always make it better. I don't know what I would do if I didn't have an internal Nell Painter editor that worked in, now works in my head. Others are just wise and full of grace. When I confessed to one friend, let's call her Camille, because that's her name, <laughs> I was gonna, that I was going to talk about why friendship mattered, she said to me, give yourself a big hug and tell the, your folks tomorrow that having friends who love you makes it easier to love yourself. It helps in hard times. And those of you that are younger than me, I don't want to scare you, but you will have hard times. And so it is important to have a friend and have a friend that can also tell you it's not that deep. <laughs> you know, wait till you really have hard times. Uh, my oldest friend who I went to, who has been with me from when we were three years old in dance school, we went to college together. Uh, she called me from D.C. on Sunday and said when she opened the prayer book that morning in church, it was, she, it was one that I had dedicated to the memory of my grandmother. In more than 10 years of our hunting through the pews of 19th Street Baptist Church for the four prayer books we had dedicated to our families, Neither one of us had ever found one until Sunday. And in fact, we uh, suspected that they really did not exist. This gets me to my next point. My faith journey matters. I was raised with Baptist grandmothers, confirmed as an Episcopalian, and taken to plenty of Pentecostal churches as a child. This both confused me and made me a lifelong skeptic of their competing claims. How could each be correct? And then there were those vexing class, color, and enthusiasm distinctions 
within black denominations. This is how I developed my critical analytics way before college. What exactly was going on here? Yet at the same time, I could feel in those, in those meetings and in those uh, uh, church services, as the song says, something within. A connection in the congregation with something larger, something divine. In college, I had to have two semesters of critical Bible studies, and sometimes I attended black churches in Boston. But after college, I became much more interested in African religions, joining with a group in New York and, and living for a short time in a religious shrine in Accra, Ghana. But I had that same searching spirit and skeptical mind. Here, too, in Ghana, was the contrast between the attempts of the congregation to encounter the divine and the earthly brothers and sisters who ran the religious shrine, who, I t it turned out, were also very serious capitalists. Uh, after much ser searching, I, became, I, I have come to believe that all belief systems share basic values and that all church spiritual hierarchies have their own special hypocrisies. In another life, perhaps I would have progressed to becoming a Baha'i or a Buddhist, but in this life I've gone back to being a lapsed Baptist or, as many people would say, a CME Christian, that is to say, a Christmas Easter and Mother's Day, a Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter Christian. Why? I could explain it best from, with a line from an old song. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good enough, and you just add all the saints, your grandmother, everybody else. But I don't want my religion old or new time to be sexist or homophobic, so I keep searching. I just don't believe, honestly, that there's one way to encounter the divine or one faith that will make the little light within each of us shine. My faith journey helps me be a better historian because it reminds me that not all black people were religious and that spirituality is complex, multi-layered, and ever-changing. The past matters to me. It's why I became a historian. It's how my family raised me. It's reflected in my faith. It binds me to my friends. The past was deep in my bones before I ever heard of the DNA's double helix. My children don't like to go to uh, the mo a historical movie with me because they say I complain too much. <laughs> Nobody would want to go to... Uh, what a, a uh, slave plantation with me, I know that they don't always, they don't usually call them slave plantations because I am sure to completely act out, uh, especially when they ta start talking about the servants' quarters, uh, as if people could come and go and were paid. I owe a debt and feel an obligation to the past that I try to serve with my teaching, research, writing, in my civic life, and in my work with students. The past sings to me. It murmurs and mutters. It's as, elu as elusive as a slave register, counting property, but not capturing humanity, intent, or character. And the past is as plain as the X signed by my great-grandfather, Frank Rusin, on the homestead deed for 120 acres of hard-won rocky Missouri soil, deep in the heart of Jesse James and Ku Klux Klan territory that my family still owns. So let me work backward from my family's values to connect to my love affair with the past to help you understand why the past matters so, me, so much to me. My family. I was born by the river in a little tent, 
Oh, no, wait, that was Sam Cooke. Uh, seriously, I was born in segregated St. Louis, Missouri, which does have a river, but at the time didn't yet have the arch. The black woman doctor who delivered me at People's Hospital, a black private hospital, was in my father's class in medical school. I was raised to believe that despite segregation, black people, including black women, were equal to and often better than whites, but we did need to work twice as hard to get paid half as much. The black people who crowded my father's office carefully counted out the three or seven dollars he charged for office visits. They were a lot like my grandparents. They worked in steel mills, slaughterhouses, lumber yards, in white folks' kitchens. And if they were lucky and closer to my parents' age, they worked at good union jobs at Chrysler or McDonnell Douglas. I was warned to never think I was better or smarter. I was just luckier than they were. For not only did their hard work pay for my nice clothes, house, and car, but if ever and whenever our good fortune faded or failed, these patients would be the people I could truly count on. And of course that was true uh, when my father became very ill. This is one of the countless ways my parents instilled in me that in personal integrity, honesty, and fairness were not linked to wealth or power, but were essential even when the system of racial discrimination was unfair and dishonest. I didn't know it for a long time, but they helped me make, they helped make me become a labor historian, and they met, helped make me thirst for justice. My parents were called race people, and they fought off attempts to make us move out of our new house built by black and white artisans on land that had, had to be purchased by the contractor who was a refugee from Nazi Germany because no one would sell the lot to my dad, who had grown up just a block away. My parents instilled my first sense of belonging to a racial family that was neither doomed nor permanently defeated. And that gave me an internal GPS that would help me navigate living across the street from the white elementary school with shiny yellow buses, but walking to Lincoln School with books with its books that, black, that white children had discarded. By junior high school, we were integrated, but Missouri was integrating backwards. And so even though this was the early 60s and well after Brown versus the board, the elementary school was still segregated. My parents gave me books, poetry books by Langston Hughes and Gwendolyn Brooks, novels and essays by James Baldwin and Richard Wright, that never appeared in the curriculum of my high school or college. My black teachers insisted that I do well and sent us off to integration with high hopes. My parents' college professors at Lincoln University, unlike my college professors at Wellesley College, taught in a school that was founded by black Civil War veterans. They wrote the first histories of blacks in the West and in New England. They taught economics, chemistry, and political science. Two of their youngest professors would later become U.S. ambassadors to three independent African countries and the nation of Cyprus. And they were close friends of my future in-laws, proving that all black people really did know each other back then. And giving me an insight that became a dissertation on three generations of black social scientists that would let me get that would let me get to know well my parents one of my parents professors the historian Lorenzo Green who had worked with Carter G Woodson the father of black history and the founder of black history what's now black history month my parents also taught me black culture and history by living it they played jazz and blues 78s and and this and on the stereo and stereo with uh, 33 and a thirds and when they thought I wasn't listen, listening they played body comedy records by Moms Mabley and Red Fox a lot different from the Red Fox show and they brought African and Haitian art into our house they went to high school with Tuskegee Airmen to be 
we had picnics with Jackie Robinson and Roy Campanella and Don Newcomb when the Dodgers and other teams came to town because black athletes couldn't stay in hotels. They had to stay with black families. We went to Chuck Berry's resort, although joint would be, have been a better description, to swim because public pools and even amusement parks were off limits. Arthur Ashe, who I saw this morning, died 20 years ago today, came to live across the street from me because he couldn't play junior tennis in his hometown of Richmond, Virginia. I eavesdropped when he told my father that he had decided to attend UCLA. But it wasn't all history and all bad. Uh, we went to Illinois football, cheered the baseball, cheered against the baseball Cardinals until they got black players. Sports was big in the Midwest, and my dad hunted and fished and usually had a gun on him. My extended family was filled with colorful characters and good cooks, and our house was filled with laughter, love, and amazing food. Growing up under segregation, I learned that race mattered. But growing up in the Roussan family, I learned that excellence mattered more. My parents, like most middle-class parents in the 1950s and 60s, believed their children must use their relative good fortune to benefit other black people and strive to be a representative of the unrealized potential of black people. My dad was an excellent surgeon. My brilliant mother, now 92 years old, was a poverty program administrator with an MSW from Columbia University. Both of them were first generation of working from college from working class parents. What would I be? Failure was not an option, but my parents did not foresee what black power could do to a nice colored girl. Six months after Bloody Sunday, when civil rights workers were beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, my 18th birthday, I started my freshman year at Wellesley College. There were six other colored girls in my class and four upper class colored women. Four years later, six black women graduated. And we have founded a black student organization ethos, brought in and run an upward bound program for underprivileged boys and girls, created the first black studies major on the East Coast, forced the college to, fire, to hire its first black faculty members, and had personally recruited almost 75 incoming black first year students. Uh, that came in that September after we graduated. More black women than had the total number of black graduates of Wellesley up in the hundred years of its existence. When I was in college, I thought that the way I might give back was to teach black history in middle school. One of the ironies uh, of course, now I realize I really would not, didn't, probably wouldn't have wanted to teach middle school ch ch children a, a truly dreadful age <laughs> that I think, you know, really you have to have a special gift. But the irony for me was I went to Harvard Ed School, got a Master's of Art in Teaching and Social Science, Social Studies, and I couldn't get a teaching job in Washington, D.C. or California because I ha didn't have uh, the state education credential. And so this is how I became. So instead, I got a lifetime community college credential. It's interesting. I could teach community college but not junior high school. And I became head of the ethnic studies department at Mills College. This is all the power, it was about student power. Students brought black studies, Asian American studies, Chicano Latino studies to unwilling campuses. And those campuses were wanted to hire people very quickly. And they also wanted these new fields, ethnic studies, to fail. I soon knew that I did not want black studies, ethnic studies to fail, and therefore I needed to get a PhD. And that 
would take us to a whole nother story. But I needed to get a PhD so that I could turn the past into history uh, and that I could try to bring the values I got from my family, which were integrity, fairness, and honesty to my study of the past and also try to encourage that in my students. And I want to conclude by taking you a step back to Wellesley College in uh, something I wrote with an article uh, uh, that I wrote about uh, the first black woman to get a PhD in economics and uh, one of three black, three, one of the first three black women to get PhDs uh, in the United States, Sadie T. Alexander. Uh, but in, before this, in this particular book, we all wrote, which is called Sister Circle, we all wrote uh, a personal statement, and this is my personal statement. This is how I became to be a labor and intellectual historian. This is about faith. In my junior and senior years of college, I had a small room with a large window high above the rest of the campus, overlooking a vast expanse of green hills and a road I hope would lead to tomorrow. Outside that room, I appeared to be a self-confident campus militant. Inside, I paced, eyes focused on the far horizon, meditating, meditating on the messy and seemingly uncharted transition I was making from colored girl and Negro student to black woman and what else I did not know. One day, there was a long line of women standing directly behind, directly behind, and so close behind me at that window that there was no denying that we were kin. A quick backward glimpse at what could only be seen in my mind's eye did little to get them out of the room. Only by looking forward could I begin to sense them separately. Each was a different size and shape all fully clothed. Some wore aprons and head ties properly fastened. Some wore big Sunday hats. Dark hands held hose, baskets, books, or Bibles. Their faces were in shadow, so I couldn't see just how they had lined themselves up. Was my mama Rusan at the front or the end of the line? And did the formidable Aunt Georges of both my parents stand together? Why so many? Their presence was humbling, mocking, inspiring, and puzzling. What did they want? We're here. We've always been here, was their silent witness. A gift, softer than a sigh, more palpable than a pulse. I write mo both to make them visible and to take my place in our line. Thank you. Okay, questions? Well, before, are we, so sorry. I'm sorry, I have allergies. I don't know if the rest of you are having an L. This always happens just before I'm going to have a speech. So I'm not crying. <laughs> My allergies are acting up, and you know, you have to almost be a criminal to get Sudafed these days. <laughs> I don't know if you've had this experience. You know, if you want pseudoephedrine because of met crystal meth, yeah. people stealing for crystal meth, you actually have to sign something like you're getting heroin or, you know, codeine or something. And so I've been using fake pseudoephedrine, and obviously it's not working. Uh, I think somebody has, oh, oh, this lady, the student in the back has a uh, handheld mic. If you have questions, comments. Hi, Professor Wilson. Hi. <clears throat> you said you have three sons? Two sons. Two sons, okay. So how do you think this generation, this, um, well, maybe the last two or three generations, 
no, no, this, this generation. <laughs> How do you think we um, are doing in terms of remembering the past? Or do you think we just kind of, okay, enough of that, let's move on and do other things? Are we as concerned about it? Or how, how do you think it, as a generation we're I think it's it? a really a mixed bag. And I think that one of the things that has happened is that the commercialization of Black History Month, so like when McDonald's or Target, bless their hearts, uh, bring you Black History Month, you know, they make it, they don't really, I mean, they may have like a little snippet, but they don't really engage people and students don't learn things and our life sometimes is so busy that we don't tell our stu our kids stories about the past. I mean, I heard stories about my grandparents' grandparents who were enslaved. And so I knew that the people who were enslaved were not stupid and they weren't happy and you know but but they were skilled they could do things they could make things my my mother's great my mother's grandparents walked from Alabama to Arkansas and built a life there uh but and so i think as we get further and further from those stories we we are looking at television together but we're not talking and you know i i don't blame I don't really blame the students, and I think there's also a tendency, especially in the United States, to avoid difficult discussions. And so uh, when I taught at University of Michigan Flint, I'd have students talk to me about greedy auto workers, and I was like, you're only here because of because auto workers had a sit down strike and that's why you you know you're you're in college and you your parents have two cars and a and a vacation home in Florida and um they had never heard about the sit down strike so i think that uh it's not just black students or students when i teach one of the most common remarks that students make is why didn't why didn't somebody tell me this before? <laughs> uh, so, you know, we aren't do. it's not, now, when I started, it was like, I thought the issue was just information. It, it never actually has been information. The information is out there. There's more and more wonderful studies about black, Latino, uh, queer history, everything, but it's not getting to our students and it's not getting in a way that engages them. And so we all have a bet, we all need to do a better job. But I also think that young people through hip hop and other things, they do talk about history. They do talk about things that they're concerned. So I would, I don't, you know, I know every generation tends to say, you know, you guys don't have it together. And certainly, when I was a young person, I was the first to say that my parents were lame. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, I think that's a, another kind of generational thing and very American. Uh, we want the new. We don't want to be bothered with that old stuff. We don't, you know, you know, I, my son just after a long time, my youngest son just got a job and he was like, Oh, I think I'll wear these blue jeans today because everybody in my office wears blue. I'm like, no, you can't. You're not everybody. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of times they don't hear that. It's not, you know, you're just, oh, mom, yeah. You better listen to me, dear. <laughs> Um, I'm, I, I think I grew up in around, at the, around the same time period you did and um, lived very close to where you went to college. And um, I'm just curious, I know that for me during the 60s um, and the civil rights movement, what was televised was a big part of my education. 
Um, and I'm wondering what role television played for you and your friends and your colleagues during that time in the 60s, and what role you think it plays today, if it plays any at all, uh, positive or negative, in educating people about um, history? Well, I think for me personally, television, it did have a role, but it didn't have as big a role as um, perhaps even um, um, newspapers and uh, magazines like Ebony. I can remember as a very young child seeing the picture of Emmett Till, un, you, know, you know, like unembalmed in his cas open casket and thinking, I mean, I was younger than him and thinking, they kill children. Oh my God, you know, that, that, and also I remember seeing, you know, I can remember there were a lot of people that were much more active in civil rights, although my parents were active in civil rights in St. Louis. So I remember when the arch was being built, now this probably wasn't on national television, but black activists climbed up on the arch and, you know, there was a period of time the arch was halfway, it came together. They climbed up on the arch because they weren't hiring black workers. And that had, you know, and I remember seeing the buses getting ready to go to uh, Selma. My parents wouldn't let me go to Selma. Um, right after the, that horrible beating, um, the first group that went uh, to Selma was a group of uh, rabbis and nuns, Rabbi Heschel, and a group of nuns. And I wanted to go, but my parents said, no, you're still in high school, something might happen to you. And so I began to feel like, okay, when I get out of the house, <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna play a more active role. But I, th I think we're both saturated with television and so many channels, but we're, they're, they're like telling the same story. There's so many stories they aren't telling that are important. I think social media can be important. I've seen how young black people uh, at, uh, organized around Jenna Six and organized around Trayvon Martin. Young black people were using, all over the country were using social media to talk about Trayvon, the Trayvon Martin case weeks before it got on national television. So I actually think that the social media and other in, in, are, uh, are being used by young people as an organizing tool and th to keep the gaps from, uh, from what's not being, what the things, the stories that aren't making it. Uh, I we used, I grew up reading a lot of newspapers, and uh, I I'm not I don't I don't privilege paper, but I think people have to search a lot harder to get information uh, as the news is uh, controlled by by fewer and fewer people. There are fewer foreign correspondents. Uh, and even national correspondence. So uh, I think that I think that makes it harder. I think it makes it harder to be an activist. It was very easy to be an activist in the '60s. Everybody, you know, you were just m pulled around. And what I was doing was scary to me, but it was safe. You know, they weren't going to bring water ho water cannons to Wellesley College. They weren't going to kill me. My parents were threatening to kill me, but the, you know, I and I, so I had a keen sense that there were people who were actually putting their lives on the line, and uh, so what I was doing, I, I I was trying to keep. I I felt passionate about it, but I I was able to keep it in perspective. It I was not in Mississippi. My dad always said Mississippi was a good place to be from. Uh, and so I actually didn't go to Mississippi until I was an adult on a civil rights tour. Uh, it, you know, you only, for my dad, you only went to the Deep South if you need to go to a funeral.
Uh, yeah, you mentioned earlier um, about the fact that your well, mother always spoke to you and told you stories and, you know, connected with you on that level. It just seems to me as if, would you agree that you were obviously closer to your parents and your grandparents than anybody today who's 19 is close to their parents or grandparents? And I think the storytelling thing may be, an, may be a big part of it because certainly when you look at Native Americans or the Aborigines in Australia, the whole concept of storytelling and passing down the lineage is a very important part of their whole culture. And I think it seems that's what's missing today, but I want to hear what you think. I do think to some extent, but I do think that, you know, it depends on the communities. I think in rural communities, people are uh, close to their parents. I think one of the things that happens is we live further from our grandparents, uh, and uh, I live near my father's parents, and my, uh, my mother's father lived in St. Louis as well. Uh, and uh, my grandmother would come, and my mother's mother would spend months with us, and so that has that's not happen that didn't happen for my kids. Uh, not that they knew their grandparents, but they weren't like living with them because of our jobs. So I think you do lose something. I don't think it's totally gone, but I think people don't prize it as much, you know, but I think like in, so, in, in the South, I think there's still more of a storytelling tradition. I mean, you know, or just what we used to call lying, you know, like not, you know, you tell these stories, they would be like tall tales. And uh, even when I was in college, uh, one, my, my now husband, then boyfriend, and I would visit uh, a man that they called Uncle Sterling, the poet Sterling Brown. And Sterling Brown would just welcome young college students to his basement, and he would tell these amazing stories about W.E.B. Du Bois, about, you know, things that were obviously, that were true, maybe, things that were obviously made up. He'd, you know, have the, you know, uh, uh, old granddad and, you know, like Southern Comfort and other stuff. And, you know, you, but it was some of those, some of the people he was telling stories to became poets themselves, like Quincy Troop. And he had also taught Toni Morrison and Amiri Baraka. You know, those kind, I think that, that, that was, that those traditions get more attenuated as we go, you know, one of the, as we spread out, uh, but I, I, I think some of it is, cla is class too. When you're in a working class culture, you're much more likely to actually just be social and talk and know stories. Students that I have today, even though they claim they went to church and Sunday school, they don't know any Bible stories. So when I when we're reading black writing, even you know from the '60s, they don't know what they don't if you they don't know what James Baldwin is talking about when he's talking about Jonah and the whale, or you know like just sort of your basic Bible stories, which actually I think I learned as much in school as in Sunday school. So I think overall the storytelling tradition, the poetry reciting tradition. We had to learn the uh, Gettysburg Address <laughs> and all these things and stand up and in every black church you had your Easter piece and you had to get up and memorize this and read it and what does that do that makes you, that gives you the confidence to become a public speaker to join, you know, like kind of adult, be, be, see this is a step toward adult society. W you know, I don't think people really, I mean, I think that happens in some churches, but I don't think people are, that's not the ritual that it was. And as onerous as I thought those Easter pieces were, you know, they helped me when I became a professor because I had been getting up and, was speaking in front, and even now, 
you wouldn't be, I haven't showed it today, but normally, if I'm speaking like this, I know you're not my mother, but whoever's the closest to me, it's like it's my mother, and what this is what she's doing, which means what? Close your legs. <laughs> so, you know, you get those, you learn how to join a society, and I don't think we're doing overall a good job. Not, I mean, I'm not talking black people, white, and I don't think we're doing a good job in uh, making, giving our young people the transition to adulthood, and I think we could all do a better job at that. Thank you. Now I want to um, thank you for sharing your stories about your family, faith, and friendships, and history. And I want to present you a gift from Ooh. the What Matters to Me and Why Committee. It's a oh, journal thank you. so that you can record, continue to record, witness, and document your stories. Thank you. I love presents. <laughs>